Next, a hearing held to consider legislation to improve telephone network reliability. During the past few years, the public switch networks of both long distance and local exchange companies have suffered a series of debilitating outages in New York, California, and in the Washington, D.C. area. The House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Telecommunications and Finance met in mid-May to consider legislation to improve standards and cut back on telephone network outages. The subcommittee chairman, Edward Markey, and panel members took testimony from representatives of public utilities, telecommunications organizations, and bell companies. Now, the hearing. Good morning. Today the subcommittee holds a third hearing on network telephone reliability, an issue that I consider to be one of the most important areas of the Federal Communication Commission's responsibility. I hope that this hearing and the legislation that I introduced, along with Mr. Bryant of Texas and Mr. Cooper of Tennessee, will help us focus on determining what public policy changes hold the greatest potential for improving the reliability and the quality of America's telephone networks. As we move forward, it is important to realize that telephone network reliability and quality do not occur automatically as a consequence of capital investments in advanced technology. In fact, today's telephone technology, which concentrates an ever-increasing volume of voice and data communications through a decreasing number of communications nodes and pathways, it has a yin and yang quality. To the good of all, it promises dramatic increases in network capacity, capability, and survivability. But to the detriment of all, it introduces greater vulnerability to consequences of massive proportion and severity. In view of the somewhat paradoxical nature of today's telephone technology, we need to ask what step policymakers take to cope with greater network vulnerability and the threat it poses to our society. One attempt at outlining these steps is before us today. Past network failures, through though serious in their consequences, represent only the symptoms of deeper problems in the public network. We need to address these underlying problems. <clears throat> the Federal Communications Commission has taken some actions to address these problems. The formation of the Network Reliability Council, headed by Paul Henson and comprised of leaders from the industry, is an important initial step and one that holds significant potential to enhance network reliability. Its potential benefits, however, have yet to be realized. But more importantly, it is not in and of itself the entire solution to the dilemma. More needs to be done. The legislation before the subcommittee recognizes this need to do more. I see it as a starting point. It proposes to clarify and amplify the role of the FCC with regard to the regulation of network reliability. Building on recommendations from the President's Advisor on Telecommunications, <coughs> excuse me, NTIA, the bill also provides modest compensation to consumers when a ne telephone network failure results in the loss of telephone service. Following the lead of actions begun by the FCC, this legislation is anchored in partnership and networking concepts. It is proactive and not limited to reporting requirements or accident investigations. Instead, it proposes establishing a program to review and evaluate telephone reliability and quality issues on a continuous basis and in a collaborative manner. It builds a foundation upon which the Federal Communications Commission can become a truly expert partner and facilitator to the industry. But when appropriate, a more informed and more effective regulator. 
We have seen some indication that the Federal Communications Commission, with the input of the Reliability Council, is willing to em embrace effective regulation. The outage reporting requirements, as changed and improved by the Reliability Council, <clears throat> set a meaningful threshold at 30,000 lines for reporting network outages. This decision is a vast improvement over the FCC's first cut at the issue, and I commend the Reliability Council for this effort. However, any notion that this lower threshold will sunset after six months, maybe when attention has shifted elsewhere, is wrong-headed and cannot be allowed to guide the actions of the Council. We in Congress look forward to more examples of such positive input and do not expect any backsliding. It is also worth noting that as we in Congress painfully know, you only gain the confidence of the public by operating in the open. So please do not hide behind confidentiality in your actions. Though the FCC has increased its role in this area over the past year, I still see it as an underachiever. It is still unclear what the Commission does once an outage is reported. This legislation will elevate the role of the agency and in the process restore a measure of expertise to the expert agency. Let me clarify my expectation that the added expertise could be achieved with only a modest increase in personnel resources. What we are seeking here is quality, not quantity, which I expect will be the final product. That completes the opening statement of the Chair. The Chair now recognizes the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Rinaldo, the Ranking Minority Member, for an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, as you know, the nation's telephone network <clears throat> has experienced several major disruptions in the past year. Obviously, this cannot continue to occur, given that so many people depend for their safety and livelihood upon the ability of the network to function without interruption. Last year, for example, we witnessed a major outage in the New York City area that posed a significant threat to the safety of airline travelers and those on the ground. The Federal Aviation Administration has confirmed that some airplanes temporarily lost contact with air traffic controllers. Fortunately, no disaster occurred before contact was restored. Everyone here, I'm sure, agrees that such a breakdown is not tolerable. Therefore, I'm pleased that both the FAA, as you very properly stated, and the telephone companies are adopting measures to ensure that such incidents do not recur. Businesses also rely on a fun functioning network. No modern business, particularly in a service-oriented economy, can afford to operate without a telephone for several hours. Reliability of the network becomes even more crucial to American businesses as they operate in an increasingly competitive global marketplace. Our future economic health rests in part on the reliability of the network. Since the subcommittee's last hearing a month ago, the Network Reliability Council held its second meeting. I want to uh, take this opportunity to commend Paul Henson, the chairman of the council, and the other council members for their work to date. The future efforts of the Council, I feel, will be crucial to ensuring that American consumers and businesses are protected against these troubling and costly outages. It is also my understanding that the Council has made important strides. The local and long distance carriers have voluntarily agreed to lower the 50,000 person threshold for reporting an outage to the FCC to 30,000 persons for a six month trial period. After that time, the Council will evaluate the results and make a recommendation to the FCC as to whether the Commission should lower the reporting requirement. Mr. Chairman, let me commend you for your early leadership in championing efforts to ensure the reliability of the network. I look forward to working with you today and in the future to ensure that our nation's telephone network is as, as effective and reliable as everyone, all of our constituents and people here, everyone expects and rightfully <coughs> demands it to be. I thank the Chair and yield back the balance of my time. The uh, gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the Chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Ritter. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. 
Mr. Chairman, I look forward to today's hearing and to listening to each of the distinguished <coughs> members of this panel. I'd hope that their testimony clarifies for us the status of the industry's attempts to improve quality and reliability in the nation's telephone network and the need for federal legislation, if any, at this point in time. Mr. Chairman, I have in the past expressed my concerns respecting the majority of staff's report on network reliability, and I do not intend to revisit that matter. But I would hope that along with the testimony today, we consider the possibility that the time may not yet be ripe for legislation on this issue. I'd hope that we would inquire of the witnesses as to whether the Commission's recent initiatives, and in particular, the uh, Network Reliability Council, the NRC, might satisfy our concerns if afforded the time and the opportunity. It may be that the Network Reliability Council is the one body that can propose standards in the most salutary manner. It's a body composed of a diverse membership, including representatives of the local exchange carriers, the inter exchange carriers, state commissions, and others. It's therefore best situated to develop standards which are responsive to the concerns of the Congress while maintaining a degree of sensitivity to the regional and local factors which may cause legitimate differences in the quality of service. Of course, the FCC could promulgate rules and set mandatory national standards. The FCC could possibly issue those standards in the absence of this legislation. But with the legislation or without it, the FCC will have to go through a lengthy and detailed rulemaking proceeding, which will be subject to requests for reconsideration and judicial appeals. It may therefore be that adherence to a set of voluntary industry standards developed through the Network Reliability Council may be the quickest and most effective way to improve the network. The Commission would be able to validate that network improvement using its benchmark approach. It could be argued that the industry would be too soft on itself in setting standards. But I would note, however, that the Network Reliability Council's recent and commendable actions in lowering the threshold standards for reporting outages. Instead of soft industry set standards, I would be more concerned that any mandatory national standards set by the FCC might become a lowest common denominator and not provide the improvement in network reliability that we all seek. Network quality, and I mean total quality, is best achieved from the bottom up through incentives and not through a one-size-fits-all government mandate. These systems are too big, they are too complex, they are too different. As to the, na as to the issue of consumer competition, compensation, uh, as a non-lawyer, it seems to me that there's a very thin line between what may be just compensation and what may be a punitive award. Perhaps consumers would be better served by further investment in technology in worker education and increased training, and, and increased total quality efforts, which themselves far more increase the reality of network reliability rather than by compensation for outages in, in some punitive fashion. I, I would like to once again thank the members of the distinguished panel, and I look forward to hearing your views on these issues. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman uh, very much. Uh, we'll now turn to uh, questions from the uh, witnesses. Um, uh, it is uh, I mean, to uh, testimony, rather, and uh, would ask each of the uh, witnesses to keep their opening statement to five minutes, no more. And we will be uh, monitoring that and cut you off at uh, the five-minute uh, period. So uh, please be aware of that, and that uh, uh, during the question and answer period, you will be given an opportunity to expand upon your initial comments. So the witnesses are Mr. Kenneth Gordon, who is chairman of the Maine Public Utilities uh, Commission. He's uh, representing the National Association of Regulatory Utility uh, Commissions here today. Mr. Robert Johnson, deputy consumer counselor <coughs> for the Indiana Office of Utility Consumer uh, uh, Council Counselors. Uh, and he is the chairman of the Telecommunications uh, Committee of the National Association of State Utility Consumer Advocates. Mr. Paul Henson, who is chairman of the Network Reliability Council. Mr. Richard Brown, <coughs> president of Illinois Bell, uh, representing the United States Telephone Association. And Mr. Robert Hamilton from Hewlett Packard Company, president of uh, Telecommunications Association. So, gentlemen, we welcome you. Uh, very much uh, to the uh, committee. Uh, the um, 
uh, the telecommunications daily uh, today, telecommunications daily, as you know, for those who are watching this on C-SPAN right now, is the New York Times of communications uh, industry, and it publishes every morning. We're the lead story this hearing in the telecommunications world uh, today. But they had a very interesting uh, report, which is that since uh, April 6th, uh, when uh, under new FCC rules uh, there has been a requirement that there be a filing of any reports of outages that affected 50,000 customers, 50,000 customers for a half hour or more anywhere in the country, that two dozen such incidences have been reported across the country uh, by telephone companies, by utilities since uh, uh, April 6th. Uh, and interestingly, even as uh, the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, Al Sykes, was sitting in front of us on April 7th um, uh, at 10.20 uh, a.m. that morning, uh, there was a, uh, a, an outage reported in Warrington, Virginia, that lasted until 2.45 in the afternoon, um, almost the exact amount of time he was sitting before this committee that day telling us there was no problem, everything was under control in this particular area. So uh, I think this reporting uh, requirement is going to help us to keep on top of the issue. And I'd hope that you can make some references uh, in your opening statements to these kinds of incidences and how you uh, characterize them in terms of the overall uh, uh, industry reliability. Uh, the gentleman from Alabama has arrived. Does he wish to make an opening statement at this time? Does not. We'll then turn to our first witness, witness Mr. Ken Gordon, Chairman of the Maine Public Utilities Commission and uh, President of the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissions. Welcome, sir. If you could please pull the uh, microphone up and uh, then we can begin. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Kenneth Gordon, and I am Chairman of the Maine Public Utilities Commission and also President of the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, on whose behalf I appear today. I would note at the outset that NARUC uh, does have a member sitting on the uh, Network Reliability Council. Uh, that individual is uh, unable to be here uh, today, and so I'm appearing uh, in his place. More than 20 years ago, the NARUC recognized the need to develop model standards for evaluating the quality of telephone service provided by telephone utilities, which could be used as a guide by any state regulatory agency to establish uh, rules governing telephone service quality. The most recent version of these rules was adopted by the NARUC in 1987 and includes technical standards for installation of service, operator handled calls, network call completions, transmission, noise, customer trouble reports, and a variety of other issues. Uh, the NARUC model rules are performance-based standards and establish objectives which shall be met by all exchange carriers. Uh, additionally, the model rules include surveillance levels which would indicate that the utility may be required to investigate, take appropriate corrective action, and provide uh, reports to the regulatory uh, agencies. In March of 1992, just this year, the NARUC published the Telephone Service Quality Handbook, which was uh, prepared by our staff subcommittee on telephone service quality. And Mr. Chairman, I've asked the uh, uh, staff of the NARUC to provide the committee uh, with a copy of that report. Uh, the copy I brought with me, unfortunately, was printed backwards. Uh, reliability apparently is a problem other places as well. <laughs> the, uh, the handbook found that the need for clear standards may have increased with the introduction of alternative forms of regulation for telephone utilities. The regulatory flexibility plans adopted by the FCC and some states uh, have served to emphasize the importance of monitoring the quality of telephone service provided to customers. Although price cap regulation is expected to have beneficial effects by providing additional incentives to control costs and stimulate new services, care must be taken to ensure that cost reductions do not lead to unacceptable reductions of service quality to consumers. In addition, the appearance of multiple providers may have effects on the quality of telephone service. Some telephone companies may attempt to compete for business, on the uh, basis of service quality and reliability, and the availability of multiple providers may afford customers increased control over the levels of reliability uh, that they obtain. 
The effects, however, of such competition are as yet unknown. For all these reasons, NARUC believes that reliability standards may be helpful to both state and federal regulatory authorities and, of course, to the user community. Because of our longstanding concern with these issues, NARUC is especially pleased to have the opportunity to provide this subcommittee with its comments on H.R. 4789, the Telephone Network Reliability Improvement Act of 1992. While NARUC has not had time to formally review the bill and offer uh, comments in the form of a resolution and therefore has no official position on the bill as a whole, we can endorse many of the concepts of the bill. We are very pleased that the authors of this bill have taken into consideration the central role that state regulators play in assuring customers of quality service, and my remaining comments will address the role carved out for the states in this bill. Section 5E2 requires that throughout the process of setting reliability and service quality standards, the FCC shall coordinate and consult with state regulatory bodies to ensure their concerns are given full consideration. Section 5E5 calls for nothing in the bill to preclude the states from enacting more stringent network reliability and service quality standards. Therefore, it effectively sets minimum standards for reliability at the federal level. The NARUC has always advocated state flexibility in promulgating regulations and the provision allows for this. Conditions are very different in different states and regulators in those states must be able to fashion the best response for their communities. While the FCC standards may be uh, adequate uh, for some commissions, there may be others who wish to apply more stringent regulation. State agencies are best equipped to determine the justness and reasonableness of proposed regulations and rates and to discern uh, the individual and often unique requirements affecting different localities. And lastly, I would note that the states have long been recognized as testing laboratories of the governmental process whereby innovation and experiment may be undertaken and later retained or rejected as the results uh, dictate. Uh, we appreciate the fact that the bill allows states to first set compensation for customers whose service is disrupted and then allowing the FCC to do so in the absence of state action. And I would call it, this is not in my written remarks, but it's worth noting that the states have had a mechanism in place for a long, long time to do exactly that through the process of rate proceedings. Uh, all state regulatory commissions regularly include a consideration of telephone service quality in whatever dimensions. Uh, in rate cases, and in the event where uh, performance has been less than adequate, uh, it is not uncommon to have that uh, fact taken into account uh, in setting uh, rates of return or ordering other uh, direct action uh, of the regulated uh, entity. So there uh, does exist that mechanism which has existed uh, uh, before and uh, will continue to exist uh, indefinitely into the future uh, to address this issues. Generally, I believe my colleagues in state regulation will be supportive of the role carved out for the states in this legislation. We will formally address this issue at our summer committee meetings in July, and we will then return to you and the subcommittee more detailed remarks. Thank you very much for this opportunity to address you, and I'll be happy to handle questions uh, when you have them. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Gordon, very much. Our next uh, witness, Mr. Paul Henson, is chairman of the Network Reliability uh, Council. And uh, we welcome you, sir. And whenever you feel comfortable, please Thank begin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and gentlemen. Pleasure to be here. And I appear uh, on behalf of the um, Network Reliability Council. I perhaps should make a few disclaimers at the outset. Uh, this body uh, operates by consensus. And hence, there may well be some dissenting views from what I think is the consensus view of the committee uh, of the uh, council at this point in time. Secondly, we have some members of the council who uh, do not take positions on pending legislation and uh, the uh, ad hoc uh, telecommunication users committee specifically uh, does not do so and therefore they neither join in nor support this testimony. I'm not sure how to uh, wrap a lot into five minutes but I'm going to make a stab at it. I think America has the best telephone service that it's ever had for the best value that we have ever seen compared with other goods and services. And yet I admit that we've had some network outages that are pure disasters. And if anything, I'm here 
trying to be the, well, I, I'm the elder statesman, I might as well admit it. I'm an elder, I'm not sure I'm a statesman. <laughs> and I've been trying to retire for two years and have not made it yet. And my wife is getting tired of that. But I think within a limited period of time, this council can do some things to justify what is happening in our network and that the American people will understand if we can just do a better job of one, limiting outages, two, fixing them faster, and three, explaining fully what happened and why it won't happen again. Now, Mr. Chairman, you just cited, uh, and you read the communications news before I did. I didn't realize there had been, uh, it says approximately two dozen. I, I don't know it's 24, but it says about, oh, uh, all right. Uh, I don't want to quarrel with the chairman, certainly. Um, about two dozen incidents. As I, I run through here very hurriedly, uh, most of them are uh, switch upgrades. And this really points its finger at the problem. Our problems are arising from trying to assimilate the very rapid development of technology. And technology is being driven by, by several things. By volumes, of course. Volume, telephone volumes are doubling every seven years. I don't know how many times they've uh, doubled since I started in the business. And secondly, the new industry structure and competitive pressures are driving technology all the faster. That's good. And yet, it is, that is the bulk of our problems. Trying to assimilate these new technologies into a network that is very diverse, very complex, and composed of many separate uh, elements. We, we applaud the uh, introduction of competition. And when we talk about global competition, and we're not talking about making the carriers competitive uh, within their own industry, we're talking about making American manufacturers, purveyors of goods and services, competitive in the global marketplace. And hence the quality of their telephone service and the cost of their telephone service is paramount, is more and more a cost of production. We are kind of victims of our own success. Service has gotten so diverse, so good, that many large businesses depend on telephone service for all sorts of things that were used to, that had been done manually. Large volumes of data are dumped overnight between massive computer installations. Costs are controlled, manufacturing processes are controlled. And this is fine, this is what the industry wanted. They were trying to broaden their markets and they succeeded, perhaps more than they thought they might. And yet, 99% of every call that is offered, local and or inter-exchange, is completed successfully. According to some uh, data which was raked off by one of the working groups at the uh, uh, Reliability Council, a local switch uh, average downtime and, uh, is 1.2 minutes per quarter per switch, which indicates a reliability factor of 99.999%. I challenge the electric industry, the cable industry, any other uh, utility, if indeed telecommunications is a utility, uh, to those kind of performance standards. We, um, the NRC was created to deal with these recent outages. It's a unique uh, body of talent. The CEOs uh, represent uh, most of the major carriers, all of the major carriers, inter-exchange and uh, local, local exchange carriers. But labor is also represented. Consumer interests are represented. Large uh, business users uh, are represented. State and federal regulatory uh, bodies are represented. I think this is a well-balanced group. I think the uh, early products of this uh, group work products of this group indicate what can be done, given a little time, given a little support, given a little understanding. 
We've had two meetings. We're going to meet every 60 days, roughly, and try to move along an agenda which will address the very issues you're seeking to address in H.R. 4789, but in a different fashion. It does depend on the private sector and the reputation of uh, a lot of uh, industry people and the very strong input from our regulatory and user groups as to what it is that has convinced the American public <coughs> that we have, a, uh, we have a crisis in reliability in telecommunications service. Am I out of time? You are out of time, time Mr. Henson. That's always been my problem. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Did a good job. Uh, our next uh, witness, uh, Bob Johnson, is uh, here as the chairman of the Telecommunications uh, Committee of the National Association of State Utility Consumer Advocates. Uh, we welcome you, Mr. Johnson, and uh, whenever you feel comfortable, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am pleased to be here on behalf of the Indiana Office of Utility Consumer Counselor and NASUCA. I should mention that Ron Benz, Nasuka's president and, and the consumer advocate of Colorado, is a member of the Network Reliability Council. As Mr. Gordon mentioned was the case with NARUC, Nasuka also has not had the opportunity to specifically consider the legislation before the committee today. I am able, however, to indicate our support for the committee's examination of reliability issues and the creation of a regulatory framework to further safeguard that reliability. In recent years, and especially since divestiture, much attention has been focused on the modernization and development of a competitive telecommunications environment. But as that industry continues to, to evolve, it is equally appropriate that attention be given to ensuring that this network continue to grow, not just in product development and market structure, but in reliability as well. All the bells and whistles in the world are of little value if the telephone consumer is unable to ring those bells or hear those whistles in a reliable manner. Moreover, increased reliability underscores the promotion of universal service, a pre-divestiture touchstone that is no less salient today. Indeed, as this legislation recognizes, reliance by consumers and businesses on telecommunications will continue to grow, as will the consequences of network failures. I am able to offer several observations in support of this legislation. First, there can be no doubt that there is a concern, a legitimate concern, with the reliability of the public telephone network. The major failures that struck the nation in 1991 should be considered symptoms of a potentially much larger problem and not simply isolated incidents. As the House Committee on Government Operations reported a few months ago, the telephone network is increasingly vulnerable to service interruptions, largely because of the increasing complexity of the network and carriers' interdependence upon one another. As that House report further emphasized, the starting point to dealing with this reliability problem is to recognize that there is a problem, a realization that has only recently been grasped by federal regulators. Secondly, let me be clear that Nasuka believes this is an issue that requires intervention. It's been suggested by some that competition will deliver service quality and therefore any corrective action will be taken by the market itself. Only those blind to the appropriate role of government in providing consumer protection for the provision of essential services could make this claim. The reliability of the public telephone network is far too important and the evidence of its vulnerability far too pronounced to take such a do-nothing approach. Further, the idea that competition will deliver telephone service quality under current FCC policies is counterintuitive. Indeed, one must wonder whether the FCC's price cap regulatory scheme, which direct, directly and instantly rewards cost-cutting measures by a carrier, is the cause rather than the solution to reliability problems. Nasuka was one of many commenters to warn the FCC in 1987 that price cap regulation would give a carrier a perverse incentive to cut costs. 
and thereby reduce service quality. One must wonder, do the network reliability problems of 1991 represent the direct consequences of the FCC's lax regulatory policies? Moreover, competition, even in the best light, is not a panacea. The key to increased reliability appears to be cooperation among car carriers. It is unlikely that competition will inspire this cooperation naturally. Instead, direction will be required. Third, we believe that definable strict standards are needed to ensure reliability. Speaking for Indiana, since Nasuka has not yet had the opportunity to to consider the issue, I'm encouraged by the systematic approach taken in the legislation before the committee today. At this point, electrical power was lost in the building in which the hearing was taking place, interrupting our ability to continue recording the event. We're sorry for the inconvenience. We will now continue with our coverage of the hearing with the next witness. The quality and reliability of the public network is an issue that deserves the, the, the focus of this body and the telephone industry in general. The problems evidenced by the massive network failure, failures of 1991 are not self-correcting. Instead, they are an indication that affirmative action, action such as that contained in this legislation, is necessary to ensure the nation's telephone consumers continue to have access to a reliable telecommunications network in the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Our next witness, Mr. Richard Brown, representing the United States Telephone Association. Mr. Brown. Good morning, and thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I'm Dick Brown, the president of Illinois Bell, and I uh, very much appreciate the opportunity to speak here today. I've also been asked to testify by the United States Telephone Association, which represents more than 1,100 of America's 1,300 local exchange companies. The USTA and its members opposed the Telephone Network Reliability Improvement Act of 1992. We view it as unnecessary, it would be costly, and actually could work to the detriment of this nation's telecommunications customers. As has been said here this morning, certainly Congress has a right and a responsibility to be concerned about the reliability of our telecommunications <laughs> infrastructure. But a bill that focuses on laying blame and assessing penalties is not the way to assure reliability. The bill's basic premise seems to be that local exchange and inter-exchange companies need new federal governmental sanctions and the litigation that inevitably accompanies such sanctions to assure the reliability of their networks. That simply is not the case. We already are powerfully motivated to provide reliable customer service. Our networks serve as our economic lifeblood. When service is impaired, we lose customer confidence and we lose business. My own company learned that painful lesson four years ago when a fire destroyed our Hinsdale central office in suburban Chicago. Not only were thousands of people affected, but competitive access companies have aggressively exploited customers' memories of that situation. Hinsdale cost us revenues in the short term, and it has cost us customers in the long term. Hinsdale powerfully reinforced our belief that quality and reliability enhancements generate revenues. They are not costs to avoid. Our network today is more secure and more reliable than ever, as Mr. Henson has uh, commented on. We have diverse routing and dual hubbing among our offices, increased fire protection and network security, more stringent monitoring and training procedures. We shared what we had learned at Hinsdale with the rest of the industry. As a result, our country's telecommunications infrastructure is growing stronger and it is growing more reliable. Within the last few weeks, we have had two dramatic examples of how reliable it is. Illinois Bell's network came through the great Chicago flood virtually unscathed. 
And just last week, when cleanup workers inadvertently cut one of our major fiber optic rings in Chicago, customers were unaffected. That was the case because the calls reversed their direction and continued through the cable loop going the other way, just as the system was designed to operate. This kind of industry cooperation and sharing could be severely impaired by the proposed legislation, which would make finger pointing and perhaps fixing blame the norm. The industry doesn't need the unprecedented and arbitrary penalties currently envisioned in House Reform 4789. They don't need it to assure high quality service. Nor does it need the costly and cumbersome bureaucracy that this legislation may run the danger of creating. Please remember that with almost without exception, local exchange carriers do not provide interstate telephone service for the mass market. Our interstate customers are the inter-exchange carriers and some large corporations. And we provide only a portion of that service, interstate access. These large customers have numerous competitive alternatives from which to choose if our service doesn't satisfy them. At the state level, where local exchange carriers serve millions of customers directly, state commissions exercise stringent regulatory oversight to ensure network reliability. And those commissions hear from and act upon the complaints of customers who may be dissatisfied with us. I guess in other words, heightened customer expectations, existing state and federal regulatory requirements, growing competition, and economic self-interest all are very powerful motivators. In closing, let me emphasize we in the telecommunications industry are committed to improving the reliability of our networks. My company alone, Illinois Bell, has invested $350 million in the last 60 months specifically to improve our network's reliability. Our industry, its regulators, at both state and federal levels take very seriously the recent network service interruptions. And as an industry, we have gotten to the root causes of these specific interruptions and we are devising preventative remedies through many forms against similar reoccurrences. I thank you for my time. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Uh, the next witness will be Mr. Robert Hamilton, President of Telecommunications Association. Mr. Hamilton. Thank proceed. you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning and to you and the members of the committee. I'm the president of one of the nation's largest, most diverse telecommunications user organizations, TCA. <coughs> I'm also an information technology ear engineer at Hewlett Packard. TCA's members represent over 1,000 small and large businesses, government agencies, hospitals, and educational institutions throughout the United States. Because reliability, excuse me, because reliable, high quality service is critical to the productivity and efficiency for all of these entities, TCA greatly appreciates the opportunity to testify regarding HR 4789. Let me first note that the bill properly recognizes the crucial significance to users of dependable service. Dependable telecommunications service is essential to the health, safety, and economic well-being of American citizens. I would like to give you three simple examples drawn from experience of TCA's members. First, many TCA members are local government agencies that operate public safety and emergency response services. These services, such as E911, often are provided through tandem switches that serve the entire county. Outages affecting these switches can cut off ambulance, police, and or fire service to thousands of square mile areas. Second, for a bank with an ATM network, an outage affecting the lines to the customer database computer can leave millions of customers in a multi-state area without ready access to their monies. Third, Many TCA members utilize integrated voice, data, and video capabilities to manufacture products. For example, a company may tie together engineers at four remote sites with video conferencing and data links to transmit blueprints, circuit diagrams, and the results of analytical data tests. 
An outage can idle entire engineering departments and set back the design process by substantial multiple of time service is down, plus the time to reestablish the computer links, the systems, and the tests. Given the vital importance of reliability, outages have become disturbingly prevalent. While I am sure that you are all aware of the handful of catastrophic outages in the last two years, the FCC's record, records revealed a large number of other significant outages. In the fourth quarter of 1999, 1991, the Bell Operating Companies, GTE, United Telecom, and Southern New England Telephone experienced 378 outages caused by breakdowns in their own local switches. This figure does not include outages due to other causes such as fiber optic cuts. These outages affected a total of over three and a half million lines and lasted on average for 47 minutes. Looking at the longer term, in the final three quarters of 91, these carriers experienced 1,435 switch-related outages affecting over 11 million lines. There is reason to believe that reliability concerns may increase. In response to cost-cutting incentives, the carriers are dramatically reduced, have dramatically reduced their workforces. The box alone have cut approximately 20,000 employees in the last two years. Often, the most experienced people are, being, are leaving. And more deep cuts are announced. New technology such as fiber optics and signaling system seven, while providing major benefits to users, also concentrate large amount of traffic in single locations and exposes the network to all of the software glitches that can bring down a large computer. Finally, diversification into new business has diverted management attention and resources away from telephone service, as is, as is evidenced by Pactel's decision to consider spinning off their telephone operations. In light of these concerns, HR 4789 properly recognizes that the FCC, with oversight from Congress, should take effective steps to safeguard network quality and reliability. TCA does not believe the Commission should make network design, design decisions that are better left to the industry experts. It should, however, gather su sufficient information to evaluate network performance, create incentives for the carriers to give due attention to quality and reliability, and to seek to minimize the effects of outages on their users. TCA is hopeful that the agency has begun to take steps in the right direction. For example, the Commission has revised its quality, service quality reports to gather more useful information regarding outages. The agency also has appointed a Network Reliability Council to address outage concerns. At its April 29th meeting, the Council adopted some measures recommended by TCA, including a real-time reporting requirement for outages affecting facilities used to provide public safety and emergency response services. There are, however, several ser serious deficiencies in the Council's actions to date. For example, the Council decided to retain the 50,000 line cutoff for outages that should be reported to the FCC in real time. Although it currently is considering a 30,000 line threshold, unless the lower cutoff is adopted, the real time reports will ignore many severe outages. In addition, the Council rejected or ignored several important recommendations made by TCA including self-audits by the carriers with chronic reliability problems and means for minimizing the effects of outages on users. Clearly, there is considerable room for improvement in the Council's proposals and the FCC's ultimate program. TCA hopes the Commission will add to the Council's positive efforts with respect to reliability and will expand its service quality monitoring in order to ensure sufficient attention to all aspects of network performance. TCA urges Congress to encourage such steps. For example, TCA is very pleased with the bill's emphasis on data transmission quality, which is one of the largest gaps in the FCC's current program and is essential to the productivity of today's American business. In addition, TCA agrees with the bill's recognition that reliability will be promoted by requiring the carriers to share financial responsibility for the outages. Currently, users who suffer thousands of dollars in damage from outages might recover only a minimal credit for the time that their service was out. Imposing additional financial responsibility on the, characters, on the carriers 
particularly when they are negligent, would par partially compensate users and reinforce the telephone company's incentive to consider reliability when cutting costs. Let me inject two notes of caution, please. First, as the bill clearly provides, all, any penalty must be paid by the shareholders and not simply reflected in higher rates. Second, the penalty must not be so high that it threatens the carrier's ability to provide universal, high-quality service. The insight of state regulators may be helpful in determining whether the penalty in the bill is appropriate. For these reasons, TCA shares the basic objectives of H.R. 4789, and TCA also stands ready to assist in addressing these important issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hamilton, uh, very much. Um, all uh, time for questions from uh, or testimony from witnesses has uh, expired. We'll now turn to uh, questions from the uh, members of the uh, subcommittee. And as you can imagine, the members of the Congress are very interested in this issue, not only because of the implication these issues have for the telecommunications industry, but for every other industry in America as well. So the chair will recognize himself for an initial round of questions. Mr. Henson, let me begin with you. Um, help, if you could, to lay out for the subcommittee the equation as you see it in terms of the role of the private sector, that is, the telephone companies, uh, and the role of the government in uh, capsule form as to uh, what uh, responsibilities they should have in ensuring that the uh, network is reliable, that the public is protected, and that there are guarantees and uh, checks and balances built in uh, to uh, avoid the repetition of the incidences of the past. Very good, sir. I'll, I'll attempt to do so. I'm uh, persuaded that uh, private industry, and in this particular case, the telecommunications industry, industry <coughs> pardon me, sir, broadly defined as one, the motivation, two, the capability to make a, uh, a major uh, advance in uh, reliability with the uh, cooperation, oversight, uh, encouragement uh, of uh, both federal and state regulatory agencies and certainly by congressional committees. Uh, I just believe that we, uh, we in the industry, and I, I still classify myself as a part of the industry, I was for a long time. And now I'm trying to be as objective an observer and uh, uh, chairman as I know how to be, representing the consumer interests, which I, I consider the most important. But I do not believe that if we get into a confrontational um, assigning, affixing blame, affixing penalties at this point in time, uh, that it will lead to the kind of cooperation we could obtain if you let the, the NRC and, uh, and the private industry take the lead. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I don't want to assign, assign blame. I want to assign responsibility mm -hmm. for the future. Mm -hmm. In other words, I want to know who should be sitting here mm -hmm. when all of the uh, telephone service for uh, Illinois is uh, cut off in, uh, during a Christmas weekend. And uh, should it be uh, <laughs> should it be you? You're the chairman. No. Of the new, uh, you're the representing the <laughs> the the uh, network reliability council. There yep. should have been mm -hmm. national standards. Should it be mm -hmm. Mr. Brown? Should it be the FCC? Who should be the lead witness that day? Should it be the private sector or should it be the FCC? As long as we have the kind of regulatory scheme that we have at the moment, it's kind of a dichotomy. Uh, we're we're forcing competition as hard as we know how, in the industry and in the halls of Congress and in the regulatory agencies. And at the same time, we're saying we've got to have more regulation. Um, I but who do I blame at that point? Now, I want to assess responsibility now and blame later, okay? So I need someone to raise their hand right now and say, I'll be the lead witness at the huge story about the cutoff of all telephone service over the entire uh, Christmas weekend in Illinois. Who so should that because I have be? so much confidence in him that I think you ought to call Dick Brown. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. <laughs> yes. I'm, we're going to be asking him that question uh, in a second. 
but uh, my my problem is that although I'm sure Mr. Brown will step forward and uh, accept his share of the responsibility on that day, that uh, it could just as well occur in Albuquerque or uh, Boston or or uh, Los Angeles and. And, uh, and it seems to me that if we define it not as a local problem, mm -hmm. but as a national issue, uh, that uh, you have to have some kind of national standards or else we're going through each individual executive's set of standards which they established and implemented on a sui generis basis, one of a kind basis, mm -hmm. rather than looking at it in the context of a national problem. I see your point, sir. I do not know the complete answer, uh, but I do not see setting uh, rigid standards as the answer for our present dilemma. Okay. Uh, so will you, will, the Nash, will, will, you uh, will your association then ensure the reliability of the network? We're going to do our utmost to uh, ensure, yes, but uh, with an E and not an I. Uh, I understand that. Yes, okay. Uh, but what we're trying to do, and obviously, if you've uh, followed the work of the NRC at all, we, we've targeted those areas where we know our major problems have arisen. Most of them are software and powering and so forth. And most of them are human errors, or a lot of them are human error. We think that rather than standards, which might merely set a um, uh, least common denominator, what we ought to do is find the best practices in the industry. Who's got the best record? And let's emulate their work process. I agree with process. that. Let's do that. And let's oh. codify it as the minimum standard. Very good. Oh, no, well. codify it rather than use it as an example. Because the problem is, is that too many people, Mr. Henson, have too much of an incentive short term to maximize profits. Uh, they might be 62 years old. They might only have three more years to go before mm, they're about mm, to retire. Mm. Uh, they might not have a long-term view. They might not care anything that happens after their watch. This is a hypothetical situation. This is completely hypothetical. I have no idea yes. how old you are, Ms. Henson. You've already <laughs> retired two years ago. We, we have you in an afterlife uh, uh -huh. condition right now. Uh -huh. uh, almost an Elisa Mazzanari role <laughs> yeah, here, yeah, trying yeah, to yeah. help the Congress. But the, the, uh, the, the, the problem that we have is that if... if um, if, uh, if, the, if the holding out is made by the industry, mm -hmm. the competition will provide the benefits. Uh, that is that you have this uh, industry standard where you hold out the best. We find this that happens in the cable industry, for example, all the time. We bring in the best cable operator, and then all the other operators emulate the best practices mm -hmm. of that cable mm -hmm. operator mm -hmm. all across the country without any legislation whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not. <laughs> okay, so, um, so unfortunately, this is an ongoing problem that we have in uh, government, okay, that the industry sends in their best people, they mm -hmm. sit here, mm -hmm. they testify, yes. okay? They're wonderful people. Oh, yes. You fall in that lofty oh, yes. tradition, by the way, <laughs> Mr. Henson. You're oh, a very impressive guy. Yeah. Uh, but unfortunately, there's all kinds of people out there right now hoping that your testimony will persuade us that we shouldn't legislate because they have no intention of breaking their long-standing tradition of never emulating anything you've ever done in your whole life uh, other than trying to maximize short-term profits at the expense of reliability. So that's our problem. How do you get them to do something? What, sh what will be your role then in, in, in ensuring that these uh, companies uh, do, in fact, emulate the best companies? I, uh, I'd like to suggest, uh, Mr. Chairman, that uh, the minutes of the last two meetings of the NRC made a, a, a part of this uh, official record of, the, of this hearing, if you don't mind. No, without objection, we'd love to read it. And, well, I think you would. No, I, I'm um, looking forward to it. You know, they're kind of homely in, uh, in ways, but uh, when, when you get uh, the Charlie Browns of the world and, uh, uh, well, some very influential some very dedicated people who are saying this is our problem unless we fix it it's going to get worse that is the publicity is going to get worse the congress is going to get more demanding the fcc is going to be livid and we need to fix it and that spirit has been displayed in these council meetings the two that we've had everybody has volunteered whatever resources are needed and when I ask for their best people, they say, sure, go ahead. I, I really believe this is a sincere, dedicated effort 
to get the monkey off the industry's back. And what do you do to, on the renegades? How do you get the renegades to, to belly up? Competition to the, will take care of the renegades. Right. Now, how does competition work in the local residential market the, where there is no competition? How does that work? Well, uh, don't don't say there is no competition, but uh, okay. Uh, where all right, where increasing there, competition in the country has no well, competition. Well, all right, yeah, but there's there's cable and there's uh, uh, cellular radio and there's all sorts of. Uh, you support technology. cable getting into more competition on the local. Sure, you sure. Do? I support telephone getting into more competition too. Okay. Mm -hmm. So is um, uh, is the level of competition sufficient right now at the local level for local calls? That you're confident that there is no uh, problem, that there is sufficient spur for the private sector to uh, keep uh, reliability high? Perhaps today there is not the level of competition that the pure economist would say is necessary to really drive uh, best efforts. Uh, but everyone I know in the telephone industry is sufficiently aware of what's coming down the road regulatory-wise and technology-wise that they're, uh, they're saying whatever we're doing today is not adequate. Would you have any problem? I'll, I'm going to finish up in just 10 seconds. Would you have any, would, would you have any problem? Yeah, just let me finish on this line, and then I'll yield to the gentleman. Would you have any problem, then, with us in, in, uh, instituting an interim regulatory regime where there is no competition in the marketplace and the local and residential uh, loop? I, I think it would be counterproductive, Mr. Chairman. So you don't support it even where there is no competition? Well, I, I don't believe there that I can find a place where there is no competition. You just my, said my there's problem. no competition. No, I said it, there's limited competition, but the threat is uh, growing uh, very no, rapidly. We really realize it's, it's growing, but you also said it's insufficient. Insufficient by some economist standards, yes. Uh, you, you, don't, you don't subscribe to that school, though? Well, no, I'm an engineer. Okay, so, uh, so you, you don't, you then don't, uh, you don't, you're an agnostic then on the subject. You're not, you're not no, qualified not to speak? I'm not agnostic or? about anything. <laughs> All right. Then is there or is there not sufficient competition in order to ensure that the reliability will be uh, guaranteed uh, by competition at the local level? There either is or is anticipated sufficient no, competition. No, I don't want to know anticipated. Is anticipated. That, that's what drives decision making. No, that's, that's not what the drives uh, regulatory. That's not what drives Congress, though. If, 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 uh, if we were going to look at you in terms of your promises, uh, we would, uh, uh, we would uh, never be able to legislate in any area. We look at what is. I don't know. I mean, I think businesses run the same way. What is? People don't get uh, promoted on promises. People get promoted on actions. Mm -hmm. So pending the actions that, in, in fact, uh, and a lot of those actions that are going to be, in fact, made here at this subcommittee level, as to whether or not cable gets in. Well, we haven't made those decisions yet, so we're well aware of the fact that there is no competition, okay. largely across the industry. In the absence of real competition in the marketplace, should there be regulation uh, until that competition is introduced? That's the question. My answer is no. Okay, that's honest, okay. but um, and, and it's consistent with the industry position. But I don't think it is with the market Chairman, conditions. I'll be glad to hear. Thanks a lot. I, mean, I really, I'm loath to interject at this point, but I think it's absolutely pertinent. Competition is a driver to quality, no doubt about it. But, but, there is a revolution sweeping this world for quality as a key driving force to profitability. Quality and reliability are components to profitability in and of themselves. The average company, 20, 25, 30 percent, depending manufacturing or service, is, is losing money, losing dollars, losing profits due to waste, rework, mistakes, faults. And, and they've discovered this. Any company worth its weight uh, in, in, uh, in salt today knows the cost of quality is the biggest, what they call the cost of quality or the cost of poor quality, is the biggest single deterrent to profitability. And I just wanted to interject that at this point in the debate, Mr. Chairman, because it is, it was missed by Mr. Henson but it is crucial in the uh, debate over how you, how you get to reliability, you get to it through quality, how do you get to profitability, you get to it through quality, and it, it is a significant incentive there. Thanks. I, 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 will, I will reclaim my time just to conclude by saying this, uh, Mr. Henson, then I'll recognize the gentleman from New Jersey. Um, in the absence of competition, um, which is um, the ultimate protector of the consumer, um, there is no guarantee that quality will be the overriding goal because there's no uh, ultimate 
challenge to that quality because of the lack of another product that can be put into the consumer's hands. We realize that. That's a marketplace reality. And while there are those performers in the marketplace who will respond to the challenge of quality just because it's part of their own personality, we're all too aware in this subcommittee that there are too many players out in the marketplace who will succumb to just the opposite temptation to compromise quality, to only look at the short term, uh, to uh, in fact endanger the public uh, and to uh, not think about uh, the consequences for small businesses, for residential consumers. And the 20 or more incidences just since April 6th that have been reported uh, in areas of 50,000 or more customers is evidence of this uh, phenomenon. And my only uh, comment to you and to the industry would be that we do want to work with you. And we would like to have a partnership with you. But we're also cognizant of the fact that without the Federal Communications Commission uh, accepting responsibility ultimately for some national network reliability standards, that there is no guarantee that a third of the industry, that a quarter of the industry, for whatever reasons, just won't match up to the very high standards which you and other well-intentioned people in the industry might hold out to all of them without a club of enforcement over their head. And that's just the real world. And you know it, I think, and I know it. And, uh, and that's why people get fired as CEOs. And I have to make sure, though, that their mistakes weren't the mistakes that endangered the health or the safety of people who live in the country. So that concludes the uh, chair's uh, opening round of questions. We turn and recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Ronaldo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Henson, uh, since we're talking about quality, <clears throat> Let's continue down that road. In previous hearings held by this subcommittee, many of those involved in the <clears throat> recent outages have pointed to the problems associated with new computer software used to run a digital switching device called Signaling System 7 or SS7. Now, do you feel that the FCC, who has jurisdiction in this area, should establish a laboratory to test failed software or equipment? Should it establish, for example, um, something like a National Transportation Safety Board style organization within the Commission to investigate future outages caused by failed software or equipment? Or should they do something else or should they do nothing? But don't you think that if the FCC has a responsibility, even though we talk about quality driving profits, that in many instances quality is an error? It isn't there in the United States. That's one of the reasons why the automobile industry was in such trouble and trying to pull themselves out of it. That's why we have so many cars being recalled, more than uh, many of our leading competitors. Now, do you <coughs> think the FCC needs the kind of device that I just mentioned? No, sir, I do not. I recognize the need for testing uh, facilities. They're maintained by all the major uh, carriers, both uh, local exchange carriers and inter-exchange carriers. The cost of doing so is not insignificant. The cost of duplicating it at the FCC level, federal level, and or state level uh, would be duplicative. And it would come out of the ultimate taxpayer and the ratepayer. And they are not in the best position to to do this testing, to perform the interoperability tests that need to be done. You know, we we kind of operate under uh, the antitrust laws and everything else, and we haven't had the ability to sit down together and talk about common problems until we found, uh, or until uh, Chairman Sykes decided that we ought to have a reliability council, and now we have some degree of protection. But there is a a cooperative effort uh, being made by the industry to get together to test the interoperability of systems. SS7 is a, a very good example, uh, sir. It, it Again, it's this headlong rush to uh, have competitive services in being and to capture market share uh, before your opponent does or before your competitor does. But I don't see the need for the FCC to do that. We just need better cooperation at the industry level and we also have the facilities for investigating each of these outages. Once we define what, what will do we need 
to get meaningful data so that all of us can address these problems, so that we can say what the best practices ought to be, and without uh, loading down the FCC and loading down the industry with the reporting requirements. Well, I don't want to load down the industry, but if there's a severe outage in Illinois, are you telling me that Illinois Bell should investigate it and come up with a report as opposed to the FCC getting involved? And if the FCC gets involved, shouldn't they be able to pinpoint, such as the uh, National Transportation Safety Board does, the cause of the problem and be able to come up with recommendations to solve the problem? Or do you think that in all cases the company involved themselves should be handling the situation? I submit, sir, that the best talent the most expertise is resident <clears throat> in the operating company, in this case, Illinois Bell. Now, they can be supervised, they can be, uh, have all sorts of uh, questions posed by the FCC, and uh, the reports that would undoubtedly be filed in such a situation will provide that kind of information. I do not see the need for duplicating that effort uh, at the federal level, and uh, particularly uh, with the FCC, and adding to government expenditures accordingly. How do you feel about that, Mr. Hamilton? Well, I think that the expertise can be found at the, at the industry level. I think that what we want to see happen is an understanding of what the criteria that the individual telcos have as far as quality and reliability and what they're doing about it. We think extensive more uh, what you might call report card reporting on a regular basis so we can see how good each of the companies are doing with outages and things like that. I, I don't think the FCC should, should get involved with actually doing it, but I think that the individual companies should be having uh, a better reporting um, mechanism or procedure to make sure that we can see the levels. We can basically benchmark what the companies are doing. I'll get to you in a minute, Mr. Brown. Let me shift over to Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon, are any steps currently being taken at the state level, specifically before the Public Utility Commissions, to address this issue of network reliability and who's really in charge when there is a major failure? Most, I think the answer to that question is yes, and it's been an ongoing thing, not something that has simply uh, cropped up in the last three or four years as a result of the highly publicized uh, activities. Most public utility commissions have uh, accident reports, incident reports, uh, outage report uh, schemes. They vary across the states. Uh, in my own state uh, of Maine, uh, if there is a major outage, it is reported to us immediately. By the way, the threshold is a heck of a lot lower than uh, uh, the one that's being talked about uh, in this legislation. What it, what and the staff staff receives that, what evaluates is the threshold? it. What is the threshold? Uh, very, very small. Uh, uh, <clears throat> any main distribution lo uh, feeder that uh, knocks out would trigger uh, by the company a call to the commission to notify it and if the staff asked for more detailed uh, information uh, they would provide it. Uh, What's certainly if any trunk, there's not, there's, there isn't an absolute line. There isn't a, a number on that, no. What is the population of the state? population of Maine is about 1.2 million. And we've had reports uh, come into us that involve as few as a, as small a number as a few hundred telephones. Uh, out for a protracted period of time, that would come to the staff uh, just as a matter of course. It wouldn't always trigger a full-scale investigation. Often the uh, reason for it is obvious. Uh, most often in our states, a tree falling down across a wire or something of that sort. Uh, but we do keep a, a regular tally of those. I think other state commissions do too. It's the kind of information that gets fed into rate cases. Uh, so that uh, if it's not a spectacular kind of outage, which requires a, a, a definite, specific investigation, that information is accumulated in every rate case I've sat in in Maine. Uh, in the time I've been there, that's a portion of the rate case that gets examined to see if the company's uh, practices and expenditures are at the levels that are appropriate. Uh, is there a joint role? Do you, en do you envision a joint role, or could you foresee one in any regulatory scheme? with the states uh, working with the uh, FCC? If there are going to be overarching standards uh, which the states might have to live by or which might affect decisions of the companies in the states, I think we definitely want to be a part of that process because whatever standards are set uh, imply costs. 
uh, for our jurisdictions, and those are always going to be of uh, concern to us. So we're going to be want to be involved uh, in the process. I think at the federal level, where the uh, issues are primarily uh, in, ought to be interstate, where there are spillovers from state to state, uh, having to do with uh, issues that can't adequately be addressed uh, solely at the state level, uh, we definitely want to be involved. And and by the way, one of the things we like about this. A uh, piece of legislation, uh, if it were to go forward, is that it uh, apparently envisions a fairly substantial role for state action as well. Did you want to say something, Mr. Johnson? I believe Mr. Gordon's covered right. that. Let me go over to Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown, I know you're anxious to comment on this, but let me ask a question first. Will the development and uh, deployment of new technology, and we've talked a lot about that in recent hearings and even this morning, within the national network, continue to be a source of problems leading to outages? Or is this merely, uh, would you characterize it as a case of growing pains, human error, or some other phenomenon? Well, uh, Mr. Congressman, that, you know, I have to say it is growing pains. It's certainly great concern, but this is, as people have said it here in the hearing, an incredibly interconnected, complex network in this country. And we are encouraging competition. We are working standards in Illinois, for example, that interconnect many vital alternate players into, right into the mainstream of the network. And I think anytime things are this complex, this big, this technical, there is risk associated. Now, we're all about the business of minimizing that risk, I would add to the good question here, how do we share what we know when we have trouble? In the Hinsdale fire that I mentioned, that was, that was uh, dealt with on a state basis. Uh, the Illinois Commerce Commission took the lead, the state fire marshal, Belcor got involved, underwriters laboratory, consultants, the governor, and when we fixed a lot of things, and out of it came pages and pages of standards that we believe ev uh, have to do everywhere from uh, the placement of power cables to training of fire departments to diversity routing and dual hubbing of offices, we made sure that the United States industry had full access to that, had open forums, international forums where hundreds of people came, FCC was involved, and as long as we can assure a process where that kind of sharing and openness continues, we're better off for it. In other words, uh, what you're saying is uh, you'd prefer to do, to do it that way and you don't think, are you going so far as to say you don't think that any legislation is needed? Well, I, I'm go what I am saying is that with the ne Network Reliability Council and its role and mission and its very good start, we ought to take a good hard look at seeing how this supplements the need we have as an industry to get even better. My concern about the legislation is I have trouble seeing a direct cause-effect relationship between uniform standards across America and how they might get out preventing a very intricate software glitch in a complex patch in an SS7 network. I don't think the standards are going to get at that sort of thing or a work error that cuts through a big fiber cable. This gets attended to by high quality, competitive forces, losing money with revenue, competitors working these kinds of mistakes against you. I mean, that's what is going to make this network better. And this is not to say, you know, when I go in for a rate case in Illinois, I have to stand before all the consumers, five and a half million that I serve, and prove my service levels are to their satisfaction level or it impairs my ability to be financed. Okay, my time has expired. Thank you. Gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Harris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would yield for one quick question to my friend, from Mr. Eckerd. I appreciate that very much. Uh, um, to suggest that, uh, that the market is going to work here because if the phone system doesn't work, people will go somewhere else and that therefore government has no role in it seems to me to suggest that uh, the rather ludicrous proposition that if too many airplanes crash, people won't fly. I mean, of course, that's the case. Um, my brothers, I have two younger than me. One's a firefighter, and one is the operations director for emergency medical services for the city of Cleveland. They have uh, pretty important public responsibilities. If 911 doesn't work, they don't work because they can't find out about the cardiac arrest or they can't find out about the shopping center. 
And so my concern fundamentally is what my two brothers have to do because there ain't no other airplane for them to go, there ain't no other phone system for them to use. If the phone system doesn't work, they don't work. FAA, NOAA, National Weather Service, security alarm systems, 911s. That is the essence of my question. Do you not believe there is a public health and safety question here in terms of reliability for the provisions of basic essential services about which people now have become reliant on to deliver matters that protect their lives? That's my question. I appreciate my colleague from Alabama for yielding. Uh, I certainly, uh, and the industry, shares your concern with 911. That is a vital service. And I think, as opposed to the basic telephone service for uh, uh, a neighbor down the street, there are extra precautions technologically that are taken, must be taken with all of those systems. And we could go through a whole list. And uh, I'm an English major, so I won't try to be an engineer on that. But, but we must work uh, to ensure the reliability of 911. There is tremendous liability and exposure when those systems fail. And uh, I think our record has been a good one across the country. Uh, it can always be better, but uh, uh, I, you know, if, if national standards can make uh, E911 more reliable in this country, I certainly wouldn't oppose that. But there are rigid interrogations at the state level and ample sharing of that technology across the industry that have me at a level of comfort uh, at least uh, from my vantage point on that issue. Could I hear the other panelists, Mr. Hamilton? Um, let me add one more thing. First of all, let me go on record as saying that TCA doesn't really believe there's adequate competition at the local level. And our concern is that in uh, an example that you're giving us, uh, City of Cleveland, uh, E911 uh, one might have a lot of extra procedures going through. But in the uh, uh, more rural areas, the smaller populated areas. Um, we have antiquated switches. We don't have electronic switches. They're trying to force feed E911 into these areas. Um, there is no adequate competition in these type of things for us to um, go to another service. And still there are still there are the people depending on these services uh, out in the rural areas and the less populated areas. So the concern is that um, we still have to be able to have the appropriate amount of quality service, uh, whether it's across the nation or whether it's in a rural area. Mr. Gordon or Mr. Johnson, could I ask you to respond as well? Sure, please? I'll be happy to. Yeah, I do. I definitely think there's a, there's a role for government, but it is not a simple role, and it's certainly not a single faceted uh, role. As I look at it on the overall basis, uh, Government should provide uh, the kind of structures, basically, that allow the kinds of uh, service, quality, reliability, and other characteristics that we want to have uh, to evolve. And I think that involves a number of different things. In uh, service quality and reliability viewed narrowly, some of the forces uh, that Mr. Brown mentioned on the demand side that tend to push them towards more reliability certainly are there. So are some of the forces on the cost-cutting side that might tend to uh, erode a little bit of that. They're both there. And it's wh how that nets out uh, that counts. And I would point out that in some of the plans of, for incentive regulation, people have explicitly tried to build in factors uh, that would allow for that where the market itself isn't strong enough uh, uh, to do that. I think promoting the competition that somebody mentioned does allow for a reliability input uh, in several ways. Just the forces that uh, Mr. Brown mentioned, but also uh, giving people uh, who need exceptionally high levels of reliability, more than most of us perhaps do, to be able to select that out of the market. That's another aspect of this discussion that needs to brought in, be brought in. And on the standard setting, I do think government uh, plays a role here, but primarily as a facilitator to help, uh, help us around to antitrust laws if those are imposing some kind of uh, an impediment. And as to where it ought to reside, I think that's a, a matter for judgment. Uh, NTIA runs labs uh, out in Boulder that uh, historically looked at this sort of uh, issue, and maybe that's a location. Uh, but clearly, industry has a primary responsibility there. So it seems to me there's a multifaceted approach that has to be taken to this. And uh, I think state regulators also uh, have, some, uh, have some role in that process. Well, I guess that's just my point, and I will conclude on that. Firefighters and paramedics still make house calls. 
And the only way they can do that is when they are called to that house. And uh, systems that, that enhance that reliability work. Systems that don't, won't. And I appreciate my colleague from Alabama's yielding to me. I'll reclaim my time. I guess one of the things that uh, has disturbed me as much as anything that so many of the agencies that we deal with, uh, I think they stay right ahead of the posse. And uh, I know in this situation and, and hearing the testimony about New York and the problems up there, I was really surprised to hear that, uh, for instance, that the FCC had no formal reporting requirement for network outages. I was really shocked at that. And so, uh, as a consequence uh, uh, of the outrage uh, of, from the outage, uh, of course, we see the, uh, Mr. Henson, your uh, council formed, and I, I, I say as part of that, uh, the reason for the formation. And since the formation of your council, I see that, uh, that there's been at least uh, 24 incidents that have been reported uh, which affected uh, 50,000 customers or, uh, for a half hour or more. Now, my question to you would be, sir, is what uh, is your council doing? You receive uh, these reports. Uh, what do you do with them? And what do you do to see that maybe this doesn't happen again? Uh, sir, um, the reports are received by the FCC. Uh, they do not come directly to the council. Um, uh, we will, of course, uh, uh, consolidate this information and make uh, periodic reports to the council so that we know what is happening in the industry. But we hope uh, at uh, some uh, future time to make this a matter of uh, a public release, that uh, you and the American public can track our progress. And uh, like uh, scheduled airlines and uh, on-time arrivals and so forth, uh, this becomes a monthly reporting situation. Perhaps that's what it takes to restore the American uh, public's confidence uh, in the integrity of the network. Whatever it takes, that's what we're going to try to do. You mean the your council then does not uh, receive uh well, how long would you say on average after the report of an outage like this that uh, that your council would become aware of it? We haven't worked out all of the uh, arrangements between the FCC staff and uh, the council uh, uh, working groups. Uh, those are underway now. Uh, I would hope that there'd be a very little time lost uh, in the FCC translating or aggregating those reports and getting them back to the council. Well, certainly, if if the charge of, you, of the council is to work on network reliability, then uh, you should have a, a, a quick notice so, yes, that, sir. so that the council can work on it. That's what you're supposed to do, isn't it? Indeed. And how long have you been functioning? Really since uh, late February. It uh, took quite uh, some time, uh, consultation uh, between myself and uh, uh, the commissioners of the FCC and uh, staff to decide uh, who ought to be on this council and contacting all of those people and getting their uh, indication or willingness to serve. And then it took uh, some period of time before we could uh, schedule a meeting. And the first meeting was the latter part of February. Any of the, uh, let's see, well this is since April the 6th uh, that you've had the uh, 24 instance, instances that's been reported. Have you discussed any of those? at your meetings? Uh, not since April 6th, no. Oh, April 6th. Uh, we, we did have a, um, from one of our working groups, uh, we did have some information uh, outlined on each of those that had been gained from FCC reports, and uh, uh, the committee was aware of, uh, of those outages, yes. Mm -hmm. So you, uh, it's your feeling, and I think you've stated it, uh, uh, that that there should be no uh, no type of, of penalty uh, except to just let the market forces uh, uh, regulate the the problems of, of network liability. Is that what you're saying? Well, sir, at this point in time, that's that is my present thinking, and I think that represents a consensus view of the council. Um, I don't know. There, there are carrots and there are sticks. 
Uh, we talk about cooperation, and uh, Mr. Johnson talked about directing cooperation. That uh, sounds like an oxymoron to me. Uh, I, I think you uh, induce cooperation. You don't direct it. And I really think that's where we're at in, the, in trying to come to grips with this problem. Um, I don't think we need penalties at this point in time. The loss of the revenue is penalty enough. The loss of market share is further penalty. And in spite of uh, Chairman Markey's uh, uh, <laughs> belief that there is not adequate competition in the local exchange marketplace, uh, none of my colleagues, former colleagues, feel that way about it. Because it's coming, it's coming very, very rapidly. Well, let me ask you this. Now, did you uh, take a poll or a vote of your council as to this particular legislation before you came here today? No, sir, it did not. Did you talk to any of them about it? Oh, yes, I've talked to individual members of the council. Mm -hmm. How many is on the council? Thirty-five or six. Mm -hmm. How many did you talk to? Eight or ten. And were they, uh, was it a mixture of the group? Was it industry, labor, and consumers? I believe you mentioned those three. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I talked to certainly one large user group. Um, I talked to um, Ron Benz, a member of the committee. Uh, and then I talked to some carriers. And uh, I talked to Steve Hewlett from the NARUC. So I think I had a, a balance, but I simply said that I was not going to come over and try to pick holes in 4789. I was going to try to express a philosophical belief that the best thing to do at this point in time is to give us a little time and see if we can't do the very things you want done without uh, penalties, without affixing blame, and that we can... All, all boats will rise in the rising tide, but uh, uh, hell, I'm an optimist, and, uh, and yet I believe it can be done. Well, I think the problem that you run into uh, uh, when the consumers and, and the, the folks out in the country get to complaining about it, and uh, we can't hardly just tell them that we're inducers rather than uh, directors. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but... Uh, Anyhow, I appreciate your testimony and, uh, and the testimony of the other witnesses. Uh, this is, of course, we know that we're in exciting times as far as telecommunications are concerned, and we just hope that uh, our technology doesn't outrun our ability to, to, uh, to provide reliability and, and local services and other services. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, Mr. Moorhead uh, was next in time, but he is not here. You've already been yeah. recognized, right, Mr. Ritter? I appreciate that. And, uh, you, I say you have already been recognized. No, I no, have you not. have not. Okay, well then in that instance, I will recognize you, Mr. As a matter Ritter. of fact, I was here before Mr. Moorhead. Okay. Well, right. Since he's not here now, he can't even argue with me. Okay. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. And I just want to say uh, about Chairman Markey, uh, I come here uh, not to bury uh, Chairman Markey, but to praise him. Um, in, in many ways, he is responsible for a kind of national focus on network reliability, and I think he ought to be commended. But unfortunately, like all uh, or many of the more liberal Democrats uh, who find that uh, all reward flows from regulation, he is seeking to achieve these goals uh, through a kind of one-size-fits-all standardized parts approach, which really is anathema to the kind of things we're learning about how you achieve quality uh, today. Uh, anyway, government-mandated, congressionally-mandated quality is kind of the biggest oxymoron of all these days. Uh, we haven't really set ourselves up to be the, the mandators of, of total quality in any way. Um, and, and usually can create schemes and systems that uh, really defy total quality and make it impossible to achieve. So uh, with, with uh, that in the background, uh, I would like to ask some of you uh, your thoughts about uh, this, the new technology that's coming on and the uh, opportunity for 
in transition between old and new technology uh, to have uh, flaws in the system. And if you look at uh, this morning's Communications Daily, uh, some of these flaws were in, engendered by the transfer from one technology to a newer and better and more effective technology. And I guess my question is, if you have a rigid set of federally imposed standards that are punitive in nature to outages which may have resulted from a transition from the old to the new, could that have a chilling effect on going from older to newer technology? And, and could people sit back and say, well, decision makers say, well, you know, if we try this, if we take this risk to go to the, the next level of technology, and it's always some risk, there's always some possibility that there will be a flaw in a startup situation. You know, I don't know if it's worth it. We'll get pilloried uh, by uh, Congress, we'll get pilloried by the FCC, we'll get hit by one of these standards which uh, doesn't allow us the opportunity to fail at all. Um, you want to comment on that? Mr. Henson, start off, and, and then Mr. Brown, and also Mr. Hamilton, Hewlett Packard, which I might add is one of the great total quality companies in America today. I'd, I'd like to lead off, or I'd like to simply say that, yes, I think that is a distinct possibility. Unfortunately, a um, revolutionary change, you, you cannot guarantee to be risk-free. And I think that's exactly where we're at in the telecommunications industry today. You know, the parallel forces of competition and industry structure and the volumes and diversity of the transmissions and intelligence being transmitted um, is driving technology at a very rapid pace. And everybody's trying to be on the leading edge of technology, and we're taking some risks. I think we've got to find some better ways to make those same technological assimilations, but with a higher degree of confidence that we know it's going to work. And when you get computer program, two million, three million lines, human beings under pressure writing that code, uh, there can be errors. And we've got to be sophisticated enough to develop the testing techniques, techniques that we can identify those problems before they occur. It, it occurs to me that uh, the drive for uh, optimizing revenues is a, a drive for quality as well. At AT&T on Mother's Day, uh, put through 101 million calls. I know it was it was kind of good for me because uh, my mom is in Sun City, where a lot of senior citizens are. And in the past, at 10 o'clock in the morning, because I forgot to call the night before, which we usually do because we don't want to try to get through to Sun City on Mother's Day, we ended up calling at 10.30 in the morning uh, Eastern Time, and I got through right away, and I was really surprised. Wow, the bell is ringing. Um, so, you know, 110 million calls, I mean, that's got to be on the order of 110 million dollars. It's a, if, if a system like that goes down, ooh, what a tremendous hit in, uh, in, in revenue. Uh, by the way, one, one small point that may have been missed, uh, the difference between outage and outrage is a little R. You know, and, and from your standpoint, uh, that R could stand for revenues. From, from the consumer standpoint, that R stands for maybe responsibility. Uh, uh, Mr. Hamilton, you want to contribute to this? I, I'm concerned about chilling effect on application of new technology if we have a, a, a rigid set of... of uh, I, I think from TCA's viewpoint, um, the implementation of new technology is, is going to have to happen. I think it can be, can be uh, implemented if you have good quality assurance procedures and testing. Yes, I understand that you can have some human errors. Yes, I understand that little minor things can go wrong. But if you, if you put it through its paces before you implement the technology, if you are assured that it's going to work, it can be implemented without any kind of problems. I think also educating the uh, users, uh, advising them that um, you are going to a switchover, that you're making changes. I've gone through technology switch switchovers at my work. We always let our customers know that this is going to happen on this weekend at this time. Uh, 
make sure they're aware of it so they it's not a surprise when they wake up and, and their services aren't there. I think there is a lot of planning and strategic emphasis and tactical situations that can be put into place properly to alleviate that and that way assure that we continue looking at um, uh, improved technology. And I guess my question for you then, and uh, speaking as a, a representative of one of the great quality companies in this world today, um, how much how, many, how much federal regulation in, in producing the latest laser jet printer, uh, which has swept the world market uh, at low cost and high quality, how much federal regulation did you guys put up with, or, or in a new inner office software system uh, okay. connecting uh, workstations? I mean, probably not that much. Let me, let me say that I'm here to testify for TCA and not as Hewlett Packard representative, so I will not call it will not testify on anything that Hewlett Packard itself does. Yeah, but I'm 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 asking you as, you know, as someone who works for Hewlett Packard without testifying on the behalf or not. I mean, the the the, ga the gains you've made in total quality which are lit legendary have well, not been forced upon you by a one size fits all rigid s set of state or federal standards. Okay, let me let me talk then in general terms in a manufacturing sense. There are some federal there are some federal uh, standards that are established when we're dealing with certain aspects of our products. But also on the quality side of things, um, we demand from uh, manufacturers demand from people who are vendors to them. They demand quality standards. They ask that those people that are providing services for them give them what their quality standards are, and you can pick and choose, and that's where the competition mm -hmm. comes in, mm -hmm. and that's fine. If we're allowed to see the report card on what the quality and reliability of the different vendors are, we can select that. But in some cases where there's no competition, we can't. We let's, have let's, vendor. let's ask the telephone folks what their response is to this kind of openness and uh, uh, available report card on performance uh, and kind of performance measures sharing with customers. W what do you, how does the, the Network Reliability Council view these kinds of requests? Well, but let me comment on, uh, on the germ uh, nature of this question. First, okay, I would please. have to say uh, HR 4789, as it's constructed, in my view, would definitely have a chilling effect on the introduction of new technology. There are lots of forces out there today that cause us to be very, very wary, very, very cautious of new technology. When the next new patch is being added to a switch in this country, I can tell you the engineers are abuzz with who's going first, what have they done, and how the conditions in that local company may be similar or different from another operating company around the country. But when you add on to those and, and the market forces and the potential loss of revenue and things we do, as has been pointed out, with key customers to cut that sort of new technology in the early morning hours preparing our major accounts. But when you add on top of that, this kind of layered uh, punitiveness, I have to tell you, it's, uh, you know, the ambulance uh, watchers, uh, are going to be there on the legal side to make us all much more cautious. And I think that has a whole series of downsides to it we don't need. I, 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 would, I would tend to agree with that. Just that last response, my time is up, um, to uh, hear some users looking for some report cards. He, on performance, uh, performance measures, he made the comment earlier that some small, smaller, some companies that they have dealt with, um, he made the comment, that self-audits were requested by TCA for those carriers with poor, out, poor records and many outages. Get back to the chairman's point that, you know, the, the best and the brightest come to this table and some of the rest don't. Uh, do you want to just respond to that and then we'll close? No, yeah, and, and, and or Mr. Brown or, or, or Ms. Gordon as well. And um, Johnson. There is a, um, a, a whole host of comparative evaluations available now as a matter of public record. Mr. Gordon can uh, speak certainly more intelligently than I about the state regulatory side. Certainly there are, um, uh, are quality measurements uh, available as uh, public information um, at the federal level. And certainly it is my belief and it is the Council's belief that as we go forward, the more information we can share with the public about 
the performance of the system as a whole uh, is certainly to our credit. And in deference, however, to those who are really locked in head-to-head -head combat in the inter-exchange marketplace, the long-distance market, uh, we're not sure how this report card evaluation ought to be uh, handled. Uh, certainly, um, as, we, um, as we go further in this process, it's going to be known uh, the outages by AT&T at Sprint and MCI and, and other, uh, uh, other carriers. And this is going to be available to certainly the large corporate users. It's going to be available probably made available by competitors to uh, uh, residential customers. I have no trouble with that. I think that's the way we get the kind of total quality in this industry that uh, we ought to have. And that's in a f wide open competitive marketplace and um, you don't need a lot of regulation. Hewlett Packard doesn't have a lot of regulation and they've prospered and, and uh, serve the public extremely well. Mr. Gordon. Uh, just a couple of brief points in uh, <coughs> reaction to your, your initial question. I do think the risk of discouragement is real. Is and it? we have a fair amount of uh, evidence of that in other parts of uh, the regulatory environment. The risk of discouragement of? The, of innovation. If the penalties are disproportionate to the, uh, uh, to the problem that exists. And I would add in that regard that I do think uh, the state regulatory framework off offers some flexibility in that regard. Mm -hmm. uh, that is to say where you really are looking at management prudency. If something is imprudent is done, perhaps it deserves a penalty, uh, and we try to operate that way in my jurisdiction at least. If something just turns out badly but the initial decision was prudent, uh, then we don't penalize for that sort of behavior. And it, you need an ability, it seems to me, to, to make those kinds of distinctions. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, and I know that the gentleman from Pennsylvania uh, is here to uh, praise me uh, rather than to bury me. But uh, after uh, listening to his comments, uh, the only thing that I think is appropriate to uh, uh, retort would be A2, Don. Uh, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> the uh, gentleman from uh, uh, Kansas, Mr. Thank Slattery. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, um, I guess I should probably quote Groucho Marx to the chairman instead of Shakespeare or anyone else. But Groucho Marx, I think, cynically observed one time, and I can't quote him precisely, but he cynically observed that politics is the art of finding trouble and looking for trouble, finding it everywhere, diagnosing it incorrectly, and applying the wrong remedies. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, let me just observe that... Uh, I think that uh, it, these hearings are helpful. It is important for policymakers to hear from those of you in industry that are attempting to respond to a serious problem that we have had in the country and to learn what you're doing and to talk to you about what can and should be done legislatively to try to prevent this sort of thing from happening in the future. So I commend you, Mr. Chairman, for, uh, for holding these hearings and giving the members of this committee the opportunity to hear from these people. I don't often do this. In fact, I don't know that I have ever done this, but uh, today I'll break uh, rules and acknowledge uh, that Paul Henson, who um, is a neighbor of mine, not necessarily a constituent of mine, is uh, a man who I think has really distinguished himself in the telecommunications industry. And uh, I think Chairman Sykes should be commended for, for uh, a wise choice in, in selecting you, Paul, to chair this Reliability Council. So it's good to see you. And I don't know anything about the rest of you guys, but if you're half as good as Henson, you're in, you're in good shape. But uh, uh, let, me, let me just uh, also uh, express some reservations about this legislation that uh, we are talking about today. And one of, the, one of the serious concerns I have about, I guess, government in general these days is that that uh, we oftentimes in Washington focus on problems that we don't have the capacity to really solve while ignoring the problems that we should be solving. And that's something that is, that is very troubling to me. I'd like to see us focus on solving our fiscal policy problems and tax problems and this sort of thing and recognize our limitations in other areas. I have serious reservations about whether any regulator today can really stay up on the state-of-the-art technological changes 
in the telecommunications industry, uh, let alone be expected to do as we suggest in this legislation, and that is to, I quote, uh, establish minimum quantitative network reliability and service quality standards. I mean, I, whatever that is, and, and it probably changes every day out there in, in the real world. And I just have some real strong reservations about uh, whether, whether any regulatory agency here in Washington can keep up with all this stuff. And, and given the fact that it is changing every day, what's, what's a reliable standard today may not be a reliable standard six months from now. Um, and uh, I just have some strong concerns about that. Let me, let me, uh, let me just ask all of you, though, uh, when you look at this legislation, is it, is it the provision for uh, empowering the, uh, the Commission to be able to provide some kind of compensation to those that have suffered from outages. Is that more troubling to you than the idea of someone uh, at the Commission being empowered to establish these court of standards? Which, which m is most troubling to you when you look at this legislation? And the second part of my question is, what provision is there now and how do you handle compensation to customers that suffer in these outage situations. How's that handled now? And you may have answered this earlier before I arrived, but Mr. Brown or Mr. Henson? I'd be happy to start. Uh, relative to compensation, I can speak to Illinois. Uh, there are very clearly defined terms and conditions under which a customer who experiences an outage gets reimbursed. In the case, I'll use the case of the Hinsdale fire. Um, there were customers that were out with that sw switching center burning down. Uh, as long as two weeks and in some cases uh, longer and we we gave a one month credit uh, to all of those customers and then doubled it so they got a two for one now the legislation and I know we haven't talked about it yet today proposes uh, multipliers that get far greater than that I mean uh, 60 to 1 as I do my arithmetic on this and uh, I think that is counterproductive to the kinds of sharing and focus on problem solving for increased network reliability we all want. I think it's, uh, it's not going to cause my people to do any greater uh, degree of scrutiny and earnest quality uh, improving uh, knowing that that threat's there. It will make them cautious, cautious but it's not going to help them get the job done any better. So I think that uh, there's, it isn't necessary to have that level of punitive uh, directive. Uh, and relative to uh, the, the other aspect of the bill, I, I have to say that uh, when we put technology in the networks, even in my own company, and I think I'm a good representative of, American, of the American telephone uh, industry because I have a great density of urban customers and I have rural customers. Believe me, there is no one resident location, group, or person that has a monopoly on the right way to introduce technology. There is no single standard we think about. It is a very, very complex process. And as good as the FCC may be made to be, or even is today, I don't think it can work that uh, this bill, intending them to have that kind of responsibility and technological management uh, responsibility is... Uh, is borderline unfair I guess without, I, without a huge staff. Yeah, one thing that, that I would like to follow up on is, you know, should this whole question of compensation then remain, in your judgment, a, a discretionary matter for the telephone companies, or is this something that regulators at the state or federal level should, should, should be involved in? Oh, I think it definitely there should be a, a, a financial a, a penalty, and it should be outlined by the states. And I think the marketplace at work... Through the existing regulatory process with the state... Public Utility Commissions, and is it, that what you're suggesting? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, Mr. Hamilton? Uh, just, just one thought on, on the compensation. Um, if, you're, if, you're looking at, if you're looking at smaller companies uh, to double a, a, maybe have one or two lines coming into their, their building and they're out for two weeks and they get compensated 30 or $50 and they've lost thousands of dollars in business because they've been without communications. Um, that's not fair. Mm -hmm. And the issue here isn't really with the larger companies because in a lot of cases they can go out and negotiate backups. They can go out and get redundancy. But in the smaller businesses, the home, the residentials and those other areas, compensation is important because I do think that even though um, 
Mr. Brown says that, uh, yeah, they, they will be a little bit more hesitant when they go to implement these things. That's what we want. We want them to stop and think and make sure everything is done, all the T's are crossed, all the I's are dotted. And that way, when things are implemented, they're done right. And the mm -hmm. compensation is in the back of their mind. And it can't just be one or two times what their, what their actual telephone or uh, line cost is. There has to be an additional compensation because those people are losing business. Absolutely. If you look at telemarketing in, uh, companies, if, if their telephone systems go out, they sit and they still pay their employees because they don't know when the lines are coming back. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they're losing business. They're losing a lot of things in, in the marketplace that are important to them, not just because they don't have a telephone service. Yeah. They're losing business in general. I understand, and I think you make a, you know, a very good point. Let me just ask you then, Mr. Hamilton, then is this something that should be addressed at the state level or at the federal level in terms of setting these kind of standards for compensation for businesses that have lost much more than just the value of that telephone line coming into their business? Uh, to, be, to be quite honest, I, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. if it's at the federal or the state level, but I think it has to be uniform enough across the United States to make sure that it is, um, uh, it is fair for somebody in New York City, as it is in Colorado, as it is in Los Angeles mm -hmm. or, or wherever, yeah. and it's fair in the rural areas as, lo as, as well as the large metropolitan areas, mm -hmm. uh, so that it isn't inequitable across the United States. Yeah, Mr. Henson? I'm having great difficulty with uh, Mr. Hamilton's conclusion. Uh, I agree there, there needs to be some kind of a, a reimbursement uh, arrangement. Much better administered and handled at the state level. He talks about a telemarketing operation being down. It can be down because of an inner city, any inner city carrier being down, or it can be down the local loop provider, the local exchange company, alternate service providers in many of these, and most telemarketing are in large cities with redundant resources. And I can't believe that uh, anybody whose uh, livelihood is dependent on communication services wouldn't arrange for backup one way or another. And it can be done in most metropolitan areas. We've got so many different situations in this great country of ours that to try to sit here and say what's best for everybody everywhere, I think is an utter impossibility. I'm more disturbed about the fact that some think the FCC ought to manage, in effect, manage networks. Now, I have great respect for the FCC, and I've got a lot of friends over there. But they're not network managers. They, they are regulators. They, they can decide issues, and I think they do a great service. But, and, and they ought to have the power to fine. They ought to have the power to provide incentive. As, as state commissions have, most of them. There is a role for the regulator, there's a role for the industry. I'd like to have a little time to separate these things out and see if we can't make them good for the American public. Mm -hmm. I thank you for your kind remarks, uh, Congressman Slattery. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, I don't have any further questions. I, I, um, I again, would just um, observe that I think that we on this side of the panel need to be mindful of just what the limitations are of regulators in the telecommunications industry and be mindful of, uh, of just how difficult it is for them to just stay up with the state of the art and, and keep track of the change. That's my concern. It's the old law of unintended results that uh, sometimes we don't want to confront around here either. So I thank you again for calling this hearing, though I think it is important for us to hear from you all to learn what you're doing out there. And uh, I appreciate your efforts. I just observed that, that uh, I'm advised that this Reliability Council is not paid. <laughs> and is that correct? Absolutely <laughs> and, correct. And, uh, you know, I think it's important to point these kind of things out. Yeah. People watching these programs on C-SPAN or whatever think that you all are a bunch of big shots here paid for by the taxpayers or something. And, and the facts are that you're out there doing this uh, um, without government uh, compensation. And, and I think that should be recognized. Good to see you all. Gentlemen's time has expired. Here's what I'd like to ask each one of you <clears throat> to do is to give me a one minute summary statement of what you want this subcommittee re to remember as we're moving forward on the legislation which is pending before the subcommittee. What are the 
couple of big thoughts you want us to keep in our minds as, uh, as we deliberate on this issue. We'll go in reverse order of how we recognize the uh, panel in the uh, opening statements. And uh, we'll give each one of you, again, one minute. And uh, we'll begin with Mr. Hamilton. Well, I think that um, we believe that the FCC is making progress in addressing uh, the uh, network reliability concerns. We also think that the FCC and the legislation is pointed at uh, um, getting the FCC to do some things. Uh, we think that in our mind there are some additional things that they could adopt. Uh, look at the 30,000 line threshold. Look at self audits for uh, carriers that have inferiority reliability records. Uh, look at periodic analysis of the outage data information that's coming through. Look at report cards from the telcos and the people providing service. We also think that it's important to disseminate information to the end user and the customers about what, how, to, how to mitigate in outages, how to deal with them. Uh, we think that procedures for uh, cooperation uh, between the carriers is, is important and that a good thorough state of the network survey would be uh, very, very much uh, important at this time, something supervised by the FCC uh, or a, some type of reliability task force or council that they've already established. Um, I think that it's important to the small user and the large user uh, together that reliability, even in areas where there isn't compensation or, or competition, uh, like at the local level, uh, we believe that uh, compensation uh, in a in addition to just line charges, reimbursements is important as a measure to uh, set up uh, at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hamilton, very much. Uh, Mr. Brown. I, th I, uh, I would say that the issue is key. I would ask the subcommittee uh, to remember that, uh, as I think you realize, the reliability of the American telephone network has never been better. And it's not to take away from the seriousness of individual <laughs> outages, but in the total context uh, of the network and its performance and the hundreds of millions of calls a day that travel it, we, I think we have to put all of this in context. Um, we can build in to this American network total redundancy, but nothing is free. And is that really what America wants? And if so, who pays? And I've looked at the issue in terms of large customers and competition and alternate networks and what this bill means for them and, and the American ratepayer at large. Don't destroy through any legislation the cooperation, the sharing, the earnest effort by the industry today as they work to solve these kinds of highly technical problems. The assessment of fines or other punitive actions, I think, as outlined in the current draft of the bill, is counterproductive and does not get at the kind of issue and result that I believe all of us want to see, a more reliable and a higher quality telephone network. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. you, Mr. Brown, very much. Uh, Mr. Johnson. I've been disturbed by remarks uh, throughout the hearing that competition somehow leads to reliability. I don't think competition necessarily leads to reliability, nor do I think it, competition necessarily leads to service degradation. I believe that comp what competition leads to is in the mind of the particular carrier and that particular carrier's motivation on how to position himself in the market, whether to build a long-term quality system, whether to go for the short-term gain. So I think to let the marketplace work and work alone is a mistake because I think there is a role for government in ensuring the continued viability and quality of the nation's telecommunications infrastructure. And I think there's an appropriate role for the FCC in conjunction and in combination with the states to establish a baseline or a benchmark for, to ensure uh, a baseline telephone quality infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gordon. Thank you. I guess I'd wind up by saying I do think this is an area where the, where the uh, Congress should proceed with, with some care. Uh, I do think it's important to recognize continuously that this is an area where the states have, it with, have mechanisms uh, to provide balanced incentives between reliability and other kinds of uh, considerations. Uh, we look regularly 
at trade-offs between costs and all other facets of uh, telephone and, and utility service, and, and this is simply one more of those. I do think uh, it's important to provide structures for cooperation in standards. That is not an area where I think uh, cooperation automatically occurs, uh, but I do think uh, uh, industry has the lead there with government as the facilitator. And I would add, finally, uh, it is important not to bias the process against uh, innovation uh, as you make, even as you make sure that uh, people's legitimate minimum uh, expectations are, in fact, met. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gordon, very much. And Mr. Henson, you'll have the last word. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, after all, I'm not uh, sure, again, what I want to say, but I'll say it in less than a minute. I think we're um, making good progress within the industry forums, and um, I, I hope that those efforts can go forward in the um, <coughs> spirit uh, that they have begun. I recognize there is a role for government. I recognize there is a role for Congress. I guess it's a matter of degree. And um, certainly I don't want to say that uh, every uh, element of the telecommunications industry is going to be out there on a total quality program trying to improve reliability. But I think that is really what is in the mind of most of those who sit on the, on the Network Reliability Council. I think the progress is encouraging. I think it shows the ability of the Council to deal with problems. And I submit that it's still the best approach to ensure reliability in the long term through cooperation as well as uh, controlled direction by regulatory forces and by the Congress. I'd like to uh, believe that um, industry would be given a chance to show that this could work and that a constructive um, industry-government coalition uh, could work in the um, best interest of the American public. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Henson, very much. Well, this uh, subcommittee will continue to move forward very aggressively in this uh, area. We think it's a, uh, thus far an, uh, a very much uh, under-discussed uh, area of uh, American public policy as these rapid technological changes uh, are implemented in a way that have tremendous impact upon uh, businesses and consumers, individual residential users of telephones all across the country. Uh, our intention, of course, is not to inhibit the implementation of new technologies. In fact, uh, this subcommittee uh, is tasked primarily in Congress with the responsibility of ensuring that there is a rapid deployment of new technologies across the country and we don't see the, the artificial inhibition in the introduction of technology that existed in the telephone industry before our breakup of AT&T uh, and our encouragement to uh, MCI and to Sprint in the long distance area that came through this subcommittee's uh, uh, deliberations uh, and to competition and, and uh, technological um, uh, uh, in incentives that uh, we've built in across uh, the uh, telecommunications industry over the past decade. That is, in fact, what our objective is. Um, so the question isn't whether to take a risk to introduce new technologies. The question is how are those risks taken and who runs the risk of suffering the consequences of those new uh, technologies uh, being implemented without proper testing. So our view here uh, is generally that uh, we want to see the technologies implemented. Uh, but we want to see telephone companies out there doing the proper pre-testing uh, to protect against the risks which we run by small businesses, uh, by residential consumers. After the AT&T problems in New York City last year, there was no compensation for any small business for any large business, for any residential consumer, for all that uh, uh, telephone uh, outage, um, even as the FCC had found a negligence uh, in that case, the word which they use, not I. So 
there's a problem here, a disconnect in accountability. There are tremendous benefits which run to the telephone companies as they implement the new technologies. There are tremendous risks to the consumers and the small businesses uh, if something goes awry with no accountability thus yet built into the system for the telephone companies. That can't exist any longer. Now, I think it's important that Mr. Henson and other industry leaders, um, and I agree with Mr. Uh, Slattery that there is no more highly respected uh, person in the industry than Mr. Henson. Um, as they step forward, it's helpful. But it's only helpful if the FCC ultimately ensures that all industry participants have the same high standards as you have, Mr. Henson, as you have, Mr. Brown. Um, this is a little bit like the, the teacher who uh, calls pop quizzes all throughout the year. Um, uh, students don't like it. But if you don't call pop quizzes, if someone doesn't have responsibility for doing it, uh, and, and the teacher just asks all the students, well, are you all doing all your reading this semester, students? I have yet to see a student raise their hand and volunteer that they haven't done their reading yet. And at the end of the semester, unfortunately, there are too many failures because there were no pop quizzes in the course of the year. Somebody has to have responsibility for giving pop quizzes for asking the questions and for punishing those or disciplining those who are not meeting the standards uh, of, uh, of the country that we're establishing. And I'm afraid that the industry in and of itself doesn't have that capacity, only because of the very complicated interrelationship that exists within the telephone industry amongst its membership. Uh, their competitors and partners at the same time. The same thing is true in any other industry. Uh, we find it in the banking, the securities, the cable, the environmental areas. No industry is able to discipline the other chemical companies, the other cable companies, uh, the other securities firms or banking firms. Uh, they can set standards, but they can't enforce. Uh, and unfortunately, the worst thrive in that kind of ambiguous atmosphere which is created. So uh, for us then, uh, uh, while I agree with Mr. Uh, Henson, that we need benchmarking. Uh, I think it's very important, a, a concept which is very consistent with my legislation here. Um, the difference here is that you want to make it voluntary and that I want to make it mandatory. Uh, you have a faith that companies, all companies, will do the right thing. I have experience <laughs> with telephone companies, cable companies, chemical companies, oil companies, banking, securities firms before this committee over my 16 years here in Congress that tells me that all companies will not respond as you would hope to your high standards. And you at the same time will not have the enforcement mechanism to ensure with an E that they will in fact uh, meet those high standards. So. Uh, I don't think that you and I, Mr. Henson, Mr. Brown, any of you, I don't think any of us disagree with the ultimate goal that we all have for reliability uh, and efficiency in the, um, in the uh, telecommunications industry. The, the fighting issue is how we get there. And my belief is that the FCC uh, and the states have to play a bigger role in ensuring that small businesses and residential consumers are protected. And we're going to, going to continue to move forward, incorporating your good work, Mr. Henson, uh, but ensuring that uh, when the problem does arise again, which it will, and I hate to be predictive, but I think that the numbers just over the last month are indicative of what is going on out in the marketplace, more than 20 incidents in the last month. Thank God none of them major, but uh, it will happen again. Uh, that the person who will be sitting here will not be you, Mr. Henson, or you, Mr. Brown. You'll be on the second panel. The first panel, <laughs> the first panel will be the Federal Communications Commission because ultimately they have to shoulder the responsibility for ensuring the reliability of that national network. We thank each one of you. We want to continue to work with you as we move forward in the drafting of the legislation. We don't want to invoke the law of unintended consequences, but at the same time, we know that we've already invoked it out in the telecommunications uh, uh, technology world right now, and that's what has to be corrected. We thank all of you very much. This hearing is adjourned.
For more information about this hearing, contact the subcommittee at 316 House Annex No. 2 in Washington, D.C. The zip code is 20515. Coming next, it's a Democratic Leadership Council panel discussion with members of Congress. English language news from countries around the globe and the BBC World Service are now available to cable subscribers on the C-SPAN audio networks. C-SPAN is brought to you as a public service of your local cable television